Okay, um, second part of this lecture, and this is an article, a very short article, and I'll speak briefly about it. It concerns what the author, and Ian Bremer, uh, he's the CEO, your CEO, actually, for your term paper, your imagined CEO or leader. He's, um, he founded the Eurasia Group, so, and, and, um, he, he runs the Eurasia Group Risk Analysis Firm. And he talks about, in this article from a few years back, about the so-called new rules of globalization, that something has changed in particular after the global recession and the financial crisis around 2008, 2009, although it started in, in 2007, 2008 was really the... the major year in that respect and something affected the way countries politicians look at the globalization phenomenon and the risks concerned with that so ian bremer he he then takes the the focus on multinationals what they what kinds of risks that are there for them and what they can do to manage this these risks so a few of these trends he identifies um, is a major trend is is what they call an LDC protectionism LDC is a shorthand for lesser developed countries <clears throat> tariff barriers screening of FDI um, blocking of FDI etc selectivity with respect to the regions and countries with which country would like to do business and at least the sectors in which FDI is allowed um, sensitive sectors the conception of what is sensitive and strategic and not has changed um, quite clearly so if you go back to the 1990s almost no sector was deemed sensitive that's an exaggeration but <clears throat> now that view has broadened as I indicated in the first part. And then we have the domestic issue, which um, is not unusual, that domestic companies like to be supported by politicians. And often there's an, a mix between, in some countries more clearly than in others, that um, a mix or, or a link between economic actors and political actors. So the former are supported by the latter, and the latter are supported by the former. So it's kind of, of this interactive, <coughs> reciprocal um, mechanisms. But this plays out in a way that uh, ensures that foreign companies, multinational companies, experience trouble. I think the most classic example is, is, you know, if you enter India, which is a great big market and, and 1.3 billion people, some sectors are protected with high tariffs. Some sectors are protected from foreign competition uh, directly. So FDI is not allowed to come in, for instance, in retail. So foreign supermarkets who would really really like to enter the Indian market because it's it's enormous uh, they can't because the political capital of domestic retailers uh, is so big that that you know Indian politicians they haven't until now at least <clears throat> change the legisl legislation. So foreign companies are not allowed into this sector. The positive uh, effect of that is that domestic retailers, they can then, you know, manage to survive and to sell their goods. The negative effect is um, that foreign supermarkets are more efficient which means that they can offer often better and cheaper products to Indian consumers. Uh, but the Indian consumers have to, to buy their stuff from, from more expensive local stores. 
which is kind of cozy in a way because we we all or I grew up with these local corner uh, stores, inefficient and <clears throat> fairly expensive. So these big corporations they they are efficient quite often. And in this case, they would benefit consumers overall, but they would certainly not benefit the owners and workers of the local stores. So we have a battle, quite often a battle, a political battle between interests, simply. If I own a local store in or a local anything, a business in Norway, and which faced competition from abroad, from, from multinationals settling in Norway, I would certainly protest if uh, the Norwegian government, politicians changed, or uh, if they changed the legislation to allow foreign competition. I would lose my business because I couldn't compete with these foreigners. So there's a risk for international business stemming from domestic political interests and issues and battles and connections um, which is interesting and which which um, Bremer says it's it's an increased trend there as well um, so he calls this a different sort of globalization with a different flavor it's slow moving selective and a with a heavy dash of nationalism and regionalism. Um, in the golden period of globalization, of course, we have actually two. One is in, in <clears throat> much part of the second half of the, the 19th century, uh, before the World War I destroyed everything. But that's when you started with cross-border investments and trade for real, at really big volumes. The second part and the most important and deeper part of the globalization phenomenon was really from the end of the Cold War, where you know you have this this political battle, geopolitical battle has ended, and you have a coherent sort of world um, based on economic liberalist thought, specialization and a division of labor between different countries, different regions of the, of the world. And you still have that, so let's not exaggerate. But it's these trends that slow globalization, or even reverse globalization, which we probably are looking at today, actually helped by the coronavirus, because that has certainly slowed and reversed parts of, of uh, international trade investment. Um, but these longer-term trends are pointing to a slowing, possibly reversal of global, globalization, which also normally means increased geopolitical risk for international businesses. Um, <clears throat> the reasons for these developments, Bremer points to five things which he feels or, or has isolated as, as correlates of, of guarded globalization or slower globalization. globalization. One is an increased political role of vested interest. That's really domestic interests uh, or domestic actors whose interests point to, you know, we should block out FDR because we lose if foreigners come into our economy. That can be business owners in sectors of the economy who stand to lose from international competition. That can also be workers in those sectors because they also lose out if they lose their jobs because this uh, domestic company is, is outcompeted and this political pressure can create stumbling blocks for FDI I mentioned the Indian example you have a lot of others as well a second thing is that large forex reserves foreign exchange reserves that is <clears throat> and export income uh, creates for m many countries for instance, oil-rich countries along the Gulf, um, or in the Gulf, Persian Gulf, United Arab Emirates, in Saudi Arabia, and in Qatar, etc. That creates, uh, if you have all these earnings, you have less need for foreign capital to come in. 
which increases your incentives to block them out. So that's really among some of these important, not the great powers, and, and but that's um, second rank to, to put it like that. Uh, as I also indicated in the first part, you have a broader definition of national security, and that has particularly been the case for the last two or three years, that everything almost is considered a national security <clears throat> thing. I mentioned food sector, high-tech sector, information technology, infrastructure, telecoms, um, oil and gas, uh, financial services have always almost been considered a um, sensitive sectors to let foreigners you know manage your money really insurance companies banks in Norway as well and we're almost a hyper globalized uh, capitalist country we tend to earn a lot from from the way the international economy has been organized. Norway is a winner, uh, a clear winner. But even here, I mean, when foreigners, I remember a few years ago, a Finnish bank was supposed to buy a, a Norwegian bank and there was a lot of, you know, no, you can't let the Finns, not that there's anything wrong with, with Finland per se, it's our neighbor, a really good neighbor, no, they shouldn't own our banks, was the message from many. Uh, we shouldn't sell our, you know, this important thing. The oil is a you know, chapter for itself. Um, of course, we have foreign companies investing and, and operating in, in the Norwegian oil sector, but, but hell no, we wouldn't, you know, let the EU have anything to do and to say about how we govern our oil. That was a major issue in the EU election for, for Norway in the 1990s. Uh, <clears throat> so when it comes to sensitive sectors, we have they have one graph or figure here in um, uh, in the article, or Bremer has that, just some example. So to the left you have on this axis have sectors that are strategic to various home governments, Brazil, China, India, United Arab Emirates, these economically important countries, large markets, Brazil, China, India, and the United Arab Emirates is a, a stinking rich country with a lot of oil resources in parts of the country. Um, so to the left of the axis, strategic to the home government, to the right, not strategic to the home government. So the less risk is in to the right for international businesses. So in Brazil, it doesn't, you know, they don't consider retail, you know, selling of ordinary stuff, food and not least. It doesn't matter. So there's very little risk. It doesn't matter politically. It doesn't matter in security terms. So there's very little risk for international food chains or, or supermarkets to invest there. In India, they, they have placed it here, as I indicated, that, you know, a big chunk of this sector is considered sensitive. You have domestic interest wanting to block out foreigners and have succeeded uh, in doing that. So it's risky, even if you manage to sign a contract with India and are allowed into the country, you still risk this domestic opposition, which is rife, it's big, it's, it's important in India. Energy and natural resources are usually, in particular for, for energy-rich countries, a major issue. United Arab Emirates, that's their, you know, lifeline. The oil and gas that are mostly found in, <clears throat> you know, one of these seven Emirates, the Abu Dhabi, the capital, um, if the oil, if they don't have the oil, you know, the whole system almost collapses, or partly. They have some other legs to stand on, to put it like that. Uh, it's less important for India. For China, it's uh, the oil sector is, is very important. They are not self-sufficient. They have to import. It's considered strategic. It's considered 
uh, a key element of Chinese geostrategy. And then you have other things, communications, technology in China, it's, it's uh, really important. Uh, and this is at the center of, of um, uh, at the center of this high-tech trade war and which is linked to kind of a superpower battle rivalry in the US and China in particular. Infrastructure, the same thing that can be roads, airports, airlines. If you go to the US, for instance, a foreign company cannot, is not allowed to operate um, flights within the US, domestic flights. Only international flights coming in from another country and leaving to another country. Domestic flights are reserved for American companies, that's uh, American Airlines. So you have a lot of these issues in infrastructure. Now you have this telecom infrastructure, 5G technology. And now you can say that infrastructure might be moved even more to the left in, in certain countries, including in European countries. Um, so pharmaceuticals is another one, medicines and stuff. Big issue in India, big issue in in a lot of poorer countries, South Africa, um, which is a big market and, and big population, very sensitive issue there. So, now it disappeared a bit, but a fourth driving force here, China shapes more of the rules and norms. China grows and grows and grows and has done for four decades, all, more than four decades. 1.35 billion people and it's getting weightier and weightier and, and it matters how China governs their economy matters for other countries, how they can, can uh, proceed. And that's one of the major battles now and for the future Economic liberalist thought is, is based on this um, level playing field phenomenon or thinking. The European Union is actually the best example because it's almost based now on that very simple line that there should be a level playing field equal competition or possibilities of competition spanning across the EU countries. You can't subsidize firms, you can't give them advantages, you can't give local firms, domestic firms advantages, level playing field. And that's really, you know, market-based capitalism, globalization, economic liberalism. Um, major part of US thinking as well. Other countries don't think that way because it makes political sense, strategic sense often to skew the competition or to under a, a um, what we call industrial policy to govern the economy so you emphasize the importance of certain sectors which gets an advantage which counteracts really the level playing field liberalist way of thinking. And the problem is that it's not easy to get these two sorts of thinking to get them compatible. So either you have a level playing field in the world economy or you don't. And it's hard to have somebody operating with that thinking and others not operating that. Because China, for to use that as an example, and it's a big country, big economy, and then it matters if China skews the competition in certain sectors, that means that Western companies are outcompeted, and they would say outcompeted unfairly. So the rules of the game is, is uh, they are key in this battle for, you know, battle of the future and of the current situation. So Bremer, he likes to describe China and many other countries as really state capitalist countries. 
it's not level playing field thinking, it's not capitalism, you know, as an idealized phenomenon, it's a mix. The state has some interest, political, geopolitical interest, strategic interest. The state is more important than the economy. Um, and it's certainly more important than economic actors. So if the state has some, they need some strategic um, assets, strategic um, natural resources from abroad, they help their companies. And, and they, they can even accept losses financial losses just to secure the access of critical resources for the long term. And then they destroy competition and that irritates the Americans and often the Europeans as well. So that's kind of the key to understanding some of these issues today. The, the, it's you know different way of conceiving different conceptions and different way of looking and understanding and, and you know how the economy, the world economy and domestic economies are governed. And the question, the big question is, are these things compatible or not? During the Cold War you had a communist Soviet Union with their allies and their economic system centralized uh, command economy not capitalism. And then you had a second world, really, of, you know, with the US and its allies, including the Europeans. And these were really incompatible. So you couldn't have much trade. You did have trade, uh, in particular, you know, as the 1970s and 80s progressed, but very little in terms of trade and investment. Investment, foreign direct investment between these blocks were, were quite rare because they were incompatible. That's at least a main reason. They can't function, you can't have a communist world economy functioning you know, together with a capitalist economy. Either you have some compromise or you have, you know, the capitalist economy, uh, you know, on one side and separated from the communist economy. It's less severe, the schism is less now between China and the US or China and the West, but you certainly have important issues and questions, uh, concerns about compatibility. Um, and more general, the point is that less developed countries intervene more now to create an uneven playing field, to help their businesses in particular in sectors that are deemed important for the state and the nation. And, and then you skew the competition and you ensure that your companies, domestic companies, survive and prosper. And that creates risks and you shut out uh, foreigners. So, the article goes on and talks about, you know, what, what should international businesses do? What should a CEO, company leader, do uh, when the company is contemplating, thinking about entering a, a, a country? And, and there are two <coughs> questions that pop up then. And it's a question of how strategically vital one is, one's company is to the host government government of the country you want to enter. And secondly, how strategically vital are we to the home government, our own government? And, and then they, you know, sort of you have, you have, uh, you can answer yes to the first and yes to the second or no to the first and no to the second. And then you have two other options, yes to one and no to the other. So you have four possibilities. And if you're not strategically vital either to your, neither to your home government, nor to your, your host government, then it's a low-risk sector. So if you produce, um, you know, soft drinks is typical, it's, nobody cares. You know, foreigners can enter and they, and everybody loves 
loves soft drinks uh, anyway, or beer companies are often the same, uh, breweries. It doesn't matter, they're not strategically sensitive. Uh, but if, if you are, if you're in the high-tech sector now, and it doesn't matter what country you are in almost, but certainly if you're a US high-tech company, you have major problems if you want to expand into China. Uh, both for the reason that the US is very restrictive now, the government of the US administration is extremely restrictive when it comes to how much business, how much you know, technology should flow into China from the US. And that's the decoupling issue that we see right now, a partial decoupling that China and the US are in a process where they will stop trading and investing in certain sector, sectors. They'll stop trading and investment you know, between each other in certain sectors. And there are other sectors as well. And sometimes you're important to the home government, but not to the host government. And, and that changes the equation somewhat. And sometimes it's vice versa. And you have to think deeply about these issues. If you're not in the soft drink business, you know, your, your, your thinking has to be sensitive to the geopolitical risks, um, according to Bremer. And then just uh, really briefly, he goes through, you know, what more concretely, what are the possibilities, strategies, management strategies, risk mitigation strategies. You can stay home, for instance, and you can try to, you know, use your cap political capital, really, uh, to lobby the government. I mean, big firms in particular, they lobby, small firms sometimes as well, they lobby their, their, um, their government, politicians, you know, um, try to increase their value, really, so they're protected. And, and they can even use the state to fight other states. That's part of Donald Trump, the administration's um, modus operandi. They're, they're, you know, sometimes on behalf of their own firms, um, they're fighting China or <laughs> Europe. Car companies, American car companies, have, have their backing, um, have the backing of of their government. Other things as well, you can go into joint ventures, alliances with local firms, which might protect you from from political interference, since you have a domestic uh, partner. That might also be risky because your domestic partner might eat you, which happens sometimes. Big issue in, in joint ventures and partnerships in Russia was at least for a long time that big domestic companies in the oil sector, for instance, they have deep political connections. So if you go into a 50-50 partnership with a, a you know, Russian firm, you might lose after a while, you're fifty percent. Once you know the, the your partner is satisfied with your contribution, so that has happened a lot of times in in, in Russia in the post Cold War period. You know, if you have something special to to add, some special value to add to the state, if you have something the state in question, the country in question doesn't have, I mean, you're you're. Uh, that helps. Diversification is, is another issue, you know, that's always a risk management issue in a broader sense as well. If you take the real broad sense, if, if you want to mitigate or, or manage the risk, uh, lower the overall risk, if you have this big company with different investments, um, if you spread them around the world, or in this case, within the country, different sorts of, of businesses, then if you experience problem in, in, in one country or in one sector of that economy, you have, you know, different types of businesses, investments, and, and uh, you diversify them. So you can't lose your whole business. If you, if you put all your eggs in one basket, 
then you might experience some some big trouble. That's by the way what's troubling one of these big international banks, the HSBC. It's a British bank, a really old bank, which traditionally focused on Asia. So so it's it has mainly been in Hong Kong, by the way, and, and partly in China as well, in mainland uh, China. And now with all the trouble in Hong Kong, they're really, they have been really scared you know, all the issues with Hong Kong and the Chinese uh, you know, changes in, in laws and regulations. Uh, and the SBC, they have been heavily criticized for actually supporting, you know, the Beijing regime's policies towards Hong Kong. And they, they, and they have to... In one way, they have to do that because if they lose the Hong Kong business, they go out of business virtually. They're not diversified in terms of geographical spread. Build it so that you can stay. It's kind of, think, I think it refers to infrastructure investments where you, you often, um, if I remember correctly, you often... Um, uh, have to reckon that the country in question, the state, will take over your business eventually. So you build it into the contract that, okay, we're here, we own the business for 10 years, for instance. Uh, infrastructure or something, water supply or, or sewage or something. And then we operate it afterwards, but we'll transfer the formal ownership to the, the um, state. So you manage to integrate changes into the contract. Build, operate, transfer is the term often used. And lastly, you can capitalize on state capitalism. Capitalize on capitalism or state capitalism. Uh, <coughs> if you enter into a market, um, a fairly protectionist market, nationalist state, you, you you can solve a lot of these issues if you're prepared and you, for instance, um, use local labor, local people in management positions, because then you satisfy this nationalist requirement, domestic resources requirement. So some of these things are, are according to Bremer, valuable, necessary to think about before you enter into another state. So, I'll take a break now and then I'll return to the theories, ideologies, which forms the third and, and last part I would recommend.